If you would like to mark in your song books, the song of invitation is going to be number 488. 488. We'll be singing that song at the appropriate time. The sermon that I'm going to be delivering this morning is a very tough sermon for me to deliver. <laughs> to some extent, it's a little depressing. But yet, at the end of the sermon, there's going to be a positive end to it. The reason why it's depressing is because there are so many that in our world and in our community in our state, in our nation, that are lost. And that to me is a little depressing for the simple fact that on the day of judgment, if they do not do what is required by God, they're going to be lost. The very reason I became a preacher is because I wanted all men to be saved. As a matter of fact, Jesus said I came to this earth to seek and to save those that were lost. And so as the church, we are to echo that plea and to make that plea known to, uh, to mankind that Jesus died on the cross for you, for me, for all men. And all God wants from us is to obey the truth. As we look around and we see the many different types of beliefs and the many different sermons that we have probably all have heard on the different types of religions in the world, it's no doubt that many times we or man can become confused. Sometimes they may say, well, what is the right way? What is the wrong way? Is there a difference? Is there a right way? Is there a wrong way? When we investigate, or when anyone investigates any religious group, and that includes the Lord's body here, they claim to be the church. But what is the church? What is the true church? What is, is all religious groups the church? And the reason why I ask that is that every group teaches a different standard. They teach something different. Each believes something different. As a matter of fact, only one church was founded by the Son of God. All the other religious groups were founded by man. How can there be so many religious groups making the claim that they are right? That's the reason why I'm a little depressed today. Is because all these claims that man makes from, from pulpits across our nation all claim to be the way that you can go to, uh, one can go to heaven. That they are the right way to go to heaven. They all can't be right, can they? We all need to ask which way is the right way? And as, as members of the Irwin Church of Christ, we need to investigate to say, I know without a shadow of a doubt that we are going the right direction. And if every religious person alive would just take God's, a copy of God's Word and, and, and investigate it, and what God wants man to do in order to come and live with Him forever, I believe without a doubt that we can all come to the same conclusion. 
Just do what God says. So how can we know what our Father's will is for you and I? What is it that you and I can do and how can we investigate what God's will for us is? We know the answer. We, to find the truth, we just need to open up God's Word. But, but then there's so many folks that will, uh, will turn and say that, that we cannot understand the, the, the Bible. Especially we can't understand it alike. You say it means this. I say it means that. What is the right thing? This is the very reason, friends, that there are so many religious groups is that man does not agree on the Bible. It's not that they don't see it right and see it alike, but they don't agree on it. Each group has their own way of interpreting things. And they believe in the Bible and they believe in God and they also believe that the road that they're on will lead them to heaven. That is faith, but unfortunately, not all roads lead to heaven. So that is a blind faith. If you look in your Bibles at John chapter 8 and verse 32, Jesus, this is what Jesus has said to you and I. And if we claim to be followers of Christ, if we claim to be a Christian named after Jesus' name, then we need to take what Jesus said and make application of it. Jesus said something about the truth. He said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Two important things there. That man can know what the truth is. And only the truth will set us free from sin. All the ways that man has said that you can go to heaven or, or what, you, what we believe in and this will, this will release you of all sin cannot be true because Jesus made it clear that there's only one truth by stating what He said in John chapter 8, verse 32. It's not many truths. There's just one. And this truth as God has given me so that I can know what to do to be free of sin and that entitles me to a way of heaven, to the life in heaven, if I remain faithful unto death. Because if I don't follow the truth that God has set forth in the Scriptures, then how can I expect God to allow me to enter heaven when I haven't done His will? There is only one truth. And I know this is true because we see it in the very beginning of the Bible in the book of Genesis. When we look in Genesis chapter 2 and we see that Adam and Eve was created and we see that what God has given them, a beautiful place to live in. He has provided them with food and He's provided them with, with a free conscience. And he said, all you have to do to stay here is, is do what I say. The truth that I say. But then here comes Satan in, ch in chapter 3. And, and Satan says, after Eve tells him that God said, if we partake of the forbidden fruit, we're going to die. Satan says, you're not going to die. God gave him a choice. To believe the one truth. There are, there are not other truths. You see what Satan did? He was changing the word from truth to truth. There is only one. The one truth was what, Jesus, what God said to them. And Satan comes and said, No, 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 there's another truth here. I want you to believe this. And because they believed it, or because she believed it, she took of the forbidden fruit, she ate, and then she gave it to her husband, Adam. They chose to follow the false truth that Satan convinced them of. And the Scripture says their eyes were opened. 
when they did that very thing. At that point in time, they knew, both of them knew that they had messed up. I want you to consider Galatians chapter 6 and verse 3. For in Galatians chapter 6 verse 3, Paul writing to the church in Galatia said, For if anyone thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Sometimes we think we know more than what we do. My dad called that when I would act like this growing up, you're acting too big for your britches. You don't know what you're talking about. And there are many times in religious circles that people just do not understand what they are talking about. They will take God's Word and they will take a verse out of context and try to make it apply to man today when it doesn't. They try to take out God's Word when God said to do something or how to do something and say, well, because God didn't say it here, it doesn't affect me. Many times we try to be smarter than, than God when we do this. The ESV words that verse this way, For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Don't be deceived, my friends. Don't trust me this morning, my friends. Trust God's Word. I want you to make sure that what you do and how you live, being obedient to, to God's commands is because you know it, you understand it, and because God said it. Don't trust anybody but yourself. And look at God's Word and investigate that Word with an open heart and open mind and just say, what if I'm wrong? What are the consequences to me being wrong? And what is the safest thing to do? And if you know what the safest thing to do is, do it. In John chapter 17, verse 17, Jesus said that the word that we have in the Bible is truth. Everything in here is truth. And I know for a fact, there are many preachers in pulpits today that are proclaiming God's Word. Do not proclaim the whole Bible, the whole Word of God, the whole truth. They only take bits and pieces of it. And unfortunately, it calms consciences of man. But, if it is impossible to know the truth, as some people say, why would Christ make the statements that He did? You can know the truth and the truth will show and make you free. Why in John 17, 17 that the Bible is truth? If it's impossible for you and I to know the truth, why would Jesus make these statements? Friends, the reason that you and I need to know the truth is that we're going to be judged by the truth. And it is not necessarily important for us to know all the truth because we need to know enough to become a child of God. That's where our Christian life begins. We begin by obeying the gospel. Dead to self. Put Christ on in baptism. Had our sins washed away by contacting the blood of Jesus Christ through the immersion of, of baptism and then living faithful to death. Now what does it mean to live faithful to death? It means that I must grow as a Christian. I will not know everything when I die or if judgment comes, but I am required by God to grow in the knowledge. So what is the truth? And if the truth is in the Bible, and if the Bible is right, then it cannot be wrong. And if man is not teaching what is in the Bible, then it's either God or man is wrong. And if God is right, man is wrong. So this morning, I want us to consider the right way. 
the way that the Bible talks about. I want you to look at Proverbs chapter 12 before we move on. And I want you to notice what Solomon wrote in verse 12. But he also wrote the same thing, or it's recorded again in chapter 16 and verse 25. There is a way that seems right to a man. Stop right there a minute and think about that. There is a way that man tries to rationalize maybe, but they try to think that it's right. It sounds right. It seems right. Could it be right? But its end is the way of death. Spiritual death, my friends. So if we can have the right way, if we can know the right way, let's make a commitment this morning. If we are wrong in what we believe or what we think, let us commit this morning that we will change to what God wants. Not what the preacher wants, not what the elders want, but change to what God wants. Because it's God that's going to, that we're going to stand in front of on the day of judgment. It is God that we will give an account to. Will you make that commitment with me this morning? The same commitment I want you to make that as you go home and you study your Bibles at home. I want you to commit to me and to God that, that when I look in the Bible and I see that I'm doing something wrong, I will make the promise and the commitment that I will change. I will make things right. I will live for God until the day I die. Make that commitment. You have nothing to lose. But the first thing I want us to consider this morning in making this commitment, why is it that there are so many that follow other ways? And when I'm talking about other ways, I'm talking about religious way. Well, without a doubt, you have your ideas and I have my ideas. Others have their ideas of, of why people believe and think something different, do act differently in worship or say something differently. They have their reasons behind it. Many answers can follow. But I want us to consider what Solomon wrote again in Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 12. They think they are right. The thing about thinking that they are right is that it's a dangerous path. Just because something sounds good, just because something appears to be right, may not be right. Compare it to what God has said in Scripture. Because if you don't and you are wrong on the day of judgment, you're going to find out. Again, it's repeated in chapter 16 and verse 25. The key in understanding this verse lies in one word. Way. The Hebrew word way is derek. That word way means a course of life. It means a mode of action. So when Solomon wrote, there seems a way, or there is a way that seems right to man, there is a course of life. Or there is a mode of action that seems right. But the end is the way of death. It also has the meaning of following a custom. In my short time of being a minister, I have spoken to many individuals and had studies with them and, and talked to them about their religious preference. And, I, and I've come out and I've, I've asked, point blankly, why are you the religion that you are? I was just curious of what they would say. 
And I probably have the, the, the most answers I have, or the most answer I received is because, well, that's the way I was brought up. That, that's all I know. And if my mom and dad were in that, it's good enough for me. And, and besides, if they were wrong, and, you know, uh, they wouldn't deceive me. They wouldn't talk me into doing something that they, they knew was wrong. And I would ask them, I said, do you really believe that if your parents were wrong, they would want you to be wrong with them? Well, no, of course not. I, I, I know they won't. And I direct them over to the rich man and Lazarus, the account there in, in the book of Luke. And we look at where the rich man has died and went on, and he's begging Father Abraham to send Lazarus back to warn his family. He did not want his family to end up where he was. And so I asked the people that I talked to, I said, if your parents are wrong, do you think that they would want you to come? Do you think that they're not trying, or would, would they not want you to be warned? Well, yeah. What does the Bible say? Are you ready and willing to commit to what God's Word says? I don't know. You're asking a big thing of me. You're asking me to commit that my family has gone to, to a horrible place or headed to a horrible place. I said, no, you're, you're, commit, you're telling me that you knew that if they were, they wouldn't want you to come there. Man, many times, will follow customs that they are accustomed to. They will follow a religion that they were brought up in. Then they become prejudiced at anything different. They're unwilling to open the heart. Friends, if we don't have a heart, if we don't have a heart that's willing to open up, then we'll never learn. In the bulletin this week, I wrote this statement. If you're not willing to learn, no one can help you. If you are determined to learn, no one can stop you. God's Word can be learned. It all comes from the heart, friends. Now, the word way that's found in Proverbs 14 can also mean a physical path, a physical road. As we see in Numbers chapter 22 and verse 23, and this is the, um, the account of Balaam and the donkey. And you know, sometimes when I read this, I, I guess I read this when I really need to pick me up because to me it's kind of funny that Balaam is talking to a donkey and the donkey is talking to Balaam. But in, the, in this text, we see that the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way, the path, the road, with his sword drawn in his hand. And the donkey turned aside out of the path, out of the way, out of the road, and went into the field. So Balaam struck the, struck the donkey and turned her back onto the road. In this text, we can see that the word way is referring to the road when you see the very last sentence of this, of this text. But most of the time, when you study this word, this Hebrew word here, uh, Delric, it will mean or refer to a person's path in life. A person's way in life. Most of the time when that word is used, it's going to refer to how we live or how you live. Look at Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 6. In Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 6, Solomon writes, In all your ways acknowledge Him and He will direct your paths. That word way there is the same word that is used in Proverbs chapter 12 
of chapter 14 and verse 12. Way of life, course of life, custom. In all your paths of life, in all your life customs, acknowledge who? God. And He shall direct your paths. In other words, before you act on something, pray about it. Look in the Bible and see, is that in the Bible? What does God want me to do? God will direct our paths through His Word if we just allow Him to. We need to let God tell us and we need to acknowledge Him, as Solomon wrote, which means to perceive and to understand what God wants from me. So when Solomon says, in all your ways, acknowledge Him, acknowledge God to understand what He wants us to do. Number two, sometimes some will follow a path that others have laid out for. Now, it doesn't matter what religion you're, you want to talk about. It could be the Lord's Church. It could be any religious group. But if you are accustomed to following that path, chances are you're going to keep on that path. I'm very grateful that my wife decided to obey the gospel. And even though we had many, many arguments, and yes, even fights about religion, I never ceased to love her. But I believe more than anything, what convinced her that she was wrong was when she tried to convince herself that she was right and tried to prove the Bible wrong or prove me wrong. And in trying to prove me wrong, there were questions that were asked that, that her religious group could not answer. And so she decided, I need to investigate this a little bit further. And in investigating it, it came to the con she came to the conclusion that I'm wrong. I, I want to be right. Look at 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles. And let's begin in in verse, uh, chapter 20 and verse 32. Because here we see a king following his father's footsteps who followed God, but someone wicked turned his heart from God. Look at chapter 20, beginning in verse 32. Well, well, we'll begin in verse 31. So Jehoshaphat was king over Judah. He was 35 years old when he became king. And he reigned 25 years in Jerusalem. And he walked in the way of his father Ezra and did not turn aside from doing it. Doing what was right in the sight of God. We'll stop here for a moment. It is the father's responsibility in the home to bring his children up in the way of God. It is the parent's responsibility collectively to train and to teach and to help their children on the path of, of serving God. And here we see that a king followed his father's footsteps, followed, followed his father's path, and he did what was right in the sight of God. Nevertheless, the high places were were not taken away. There were uh, uh, temples that were erected to little g-gods. And he didn't remove these. For as yet the people had not directed their hearts to the God of their fathers. Now the rest of the acts of Jehoshaphat, first and last, indeed they are written in the book of Jehu and the son of Hananiah, which is mentioned in the book of kings of Israel. After this, Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, allied himself with Eliza, uh, Ahaz, excuse me. No, that's wrong too. <laughs> uh, Ahaz, king of Israel, who acted very 
wickedly. What did this king do? He followed God because his, his father followed God. And now, now he's teaming up with another king who acted very wickedly. And he allowed himself with him to make ships go to Tarsha and, and he made ships in Ezon, Gerber. He aligned himself with someone who was very wicked. And because of that, he became a little wicked. Friends, it's because of the path that we follow that someone else has laid that causes our problems in life. So let me ask you again. Please commit yourself right now this morning that if you're not on the right way, don't follow someone else's path. Follow the path that God has set out for us. Now this morning I said when I began that this was a little depressing sermon for me because of the condition of man. But that we were going to end on a high note and a happy note. And that's what I'm going to do here. We're going to end that the church, the church is required to teach the truth. Nothing but the truth. Teach God's Word. And we are required to share that truth with the lost and dying world. And so because we are required to teach it, some will accept it and some will not. I want you to look at 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 12. And I want you to look at verse 13 and following. Samuel is addressing Saul becoming a, the king. And he says, Therefore, here is the king whom you have chosen and whom you have desired. Take note, the Lord has sent a king over you. The people have a king because they wanted to be like other nations. And so they, uh, Samuel went to God and he was upset about it. And God said, don't worry, they haven't rejected you. They've rejected me from being their God. And so God gave them what they wanted, a king, and Saul was it. Then Samuel goes on. He says, if you fear the Lord and serve Him and obey His voice and do not rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then both you and the king who reigns over you will continue... Uh, 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 reigns over you will continue following the Lord your God. However, if you do not obey the voice of the Lord, but rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then the hand of the Lord will be against you, as it was against your fathers. Now therefore, stand and see this great thing which the Lord will do before you rise. Is today not the wheat of harvest? I will call to the Lord and He will send thunder and rain that you may perceive and see that your wickedness is great which you have done in the sight of the Lord in asking a king for yourselves. So Samuel called to the Lord and the Lord sent thunder and rain that day and all the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel. And all the people said to Samuel, Pray for your servants to the Lord your God that we may not die for we have added to all our sins, the evil of asking a king for ourselves. Then Samuel said to the people, Do not fear. You have done all this wickedness, yet do not turn aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. And do not turn aside, for then you would go after empty things which cannot profit or deliver, for they are nothing. Friends, let me... Stop here and say, don't turn your heart to empty things. To empty religions, to empty promises. Only God can fulfill and only God can, can give you the promises that He offers when you're obedient. Friends, we do this by teaching God's way. As we get ready to end this sermon this morning, and, and we're going to end on an on a upbeat note. We, we need to understand that we teach and preach and we pray for those to accept God's Word. 
it, I'm not going to be an enemy to anyone who refuses to accept. They, they have a choice, just like Adam and Eve. But I will never quit praying for you. I've been told, don't, don't, don't teach this anymore to me. I, I don't want, I don't want to study with you anymore. I, I don't want to hear any more about this. Okay. You can't stop me from praying for you. In Psalm 119 and 128, Psalm, uh, the, the psalmist says, I consider all your precepts to be right. Everything that God has given us is right. And then he says, I hate every false way. That's the attitude that we need to have when it comes to a false way. In Proverbs chapter 4, verse 11, Solomon said, I've taught you the way of wisdom. I've led you in the paths of, 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 of brightness. But sometimes it ends up, like we see in Proverbs chapter 21 and verse 2, where Solomon says, every man, or every way of a man, excuse me, is right in his own eyes. But the Lord weighs the heart. Everybody thinks their religious way is right. But there's only one right. There's only one truth. And God knows the heart of the person who rejects it. We teach the Bible. We teach the Bible is the right way. We teach that the Bible is the only way. So that one day, one will be in a special dwelling place. Next Lord's Day, next Lord's Day morning, I'm hoping, Lord willing, that we can consider some of the ways that are in the Bible that are right, that cannot be wrong, and investigate based on what God has said. And I ask you to be present as we study God's Word together about the right, true way. It may be that there's someone here this morning that needs to respond to the invitation. Maybe there's someone here this morning that's ready to, to say, I, I want to fall the right way. I've, I've been putting it off. There may be someone here this morning that may be saying, you know, I, I've wandered away from the right way and I know I need to get back to God. So whatever that is, whatever that need is that we can help you with, come now. Let us help you as together we stand and sing.